Um, I can also thank Bjorn for choosing the, the topic of my talk. In fact, I, I, I gave him a choice between two possible topics. And for some reason, he chose uh, the topic which is actually joint work in progress. So not everything is uh, watertight. That's, uh, but yeah, I have some co-authors. I can, I can put the blame on in case there are some mistakes. Okay, but if I misspell their names, this is entirely my fault. Uh, then there's Elden Almanto, and then there's Maria Jakerson. So let me give a starting point for this topic by stating a theorem, which probably should be attributed to Joseph Ayub. You can do the following. You can take a vector bundle. some scheme and you can send this uh, to the tom space so this is the quotient you take the total space and then you quotient out the complement of the zero section so any little z should be the zero section here uh, and this here defines a group homomorphism It starts at the zeroth k group of this um, scheme S, and it lands in the Picard group of the stable homotopy category of S, as defined by Morel and Bowatsky. And um, there is one situation which is easy to understand. and maybe also a bit boring. So if you take S to be the spectrum of a field, then this, this group homomorphism, let me also denote it TH for two, uh, then this homomorphism is injective, but in general it is not. So this can be, can be checked rather explicitly. For example, you can look at, at n-dimensional projective space, and there you have the, the bundle of minus one. And when you take, take out the zero section, then the tum space is the cone of this map, and you can identify this here with an plus one minus zero, here being the canonical map, but the same is also true for the bundle O of one minus zero, here the canonical map. So what you get is that the tome spectrum, or even the tome space, of O of 1 is the same as the tome space of O of minus 1. So this map is not injective. And uh, in fact, there's a, there's a more general statement. Whatever vector bundle you take um, over some S, The tom spectrum of that will be the equivalent to the tom spectrum of the dual. So let me take this to be the notation for the, the dual. So um, one question is then, yeah, what's, what's in the kernel of this, this group homomorphism? And before yeah, stating something on, on this question, I should um, remark at that point that there's a sort of much, much sort of more enriched version of this, this map here by, by Bachmann and Hoyoa in their paper on, on norms. They define um, this sort of motivic J-homomorphism on the level of spaces so that this here is then the induced map on the path components. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm already happy if I can say something about the path components here. Uh, let's see. No. Okay. 
Ah, yeah. And um, now I have to introduce um, a little bit of notation to, to state a theorem. And the notation might be just slightly unusual. Uh, it's uh, regarding Adams operations. And in honor of Björn, I would like to use little b as the integer for the Adams operations. Um, so I take psi b to be the bth Adams operation. So this is defined by saying what it should be should it what it should be on line bundles. So there you take um, the b tensor power. Um, and it's then determined by this uh, using the splitting principle. And uh, yeah, I'm also using the, the notation b not just for, for Buren, but also for um, uh, if I use k, you might think that k is actually the field, but this is not the case. When, when there's a field here, I will probably denote it f, so that the k for the field is not confused with the k for the k-theory, and yeah, sorry about that. Um, okay, so for example, psi to the minus 1 of um, anything, this is then uh, given by the dual, and yeah, maybe here's a theorem which produces elements in the kernel. So we take a field. And then we take, um, let's say, e to be the exponential characteristic of f. And uh, then we have um, an integer b. And this here should be invertible in f. And then we have s, a smooth f scheme. And then we take some vector bundle. So um, with all of this, we can look at the, the following element in the kernel. There exists some natural number n such that if you look at the tom space of enough copies of E, and let me write these copies by tensoring with a trivial bundle, and I denote this trivial bundle as just the um, integer giving the rank. Uh, so that's um, this on this side, and on the other side we have the Bth Adams operation applied to E. All right, and this equivalence, this is in the um, stable homotopy category of S, but perhaps we have to invert the exponential characteristic. I don't know. Okay, and uh, yeah, so far this is sort of only one half of the of the Adams conjecture. Uh, there's a there's uh, the sort of obvious um, question whether these elements then generate um, the kernel. I know that this is uh, true for uh, for curves. So if if S is a, a curve, um, it's probably true for. Uh, split quadrics, um, but this is uh, this is unclear at this 
at this point of time. I apologize for having something incomplete here and still stating, uh, saying that the title of this talk is the Motivic Adams Conjecture. Um, anyhow, so the strategy of proving this is to, to do it first for line bundles and then use some transfer argument. And what we want to produce are, are equivalences of these, these Tom spectra. So we need some, some criterion for when such a map is going to be an equivalence of Tom spectra. And I would like to, for that, state a theorem of Morel, which has been mentioned several times here this week already. Uh, so we need criterion for a map of such Tom spectra. If you have two bundles um, to be an equivalence, and it is hopefully reasonable to look at the trivial case first, where you have um, two trivial bundles of the same rank, and there we have the A1 degree, so we take F to be a field, and there's a degree map, the A1 degree, from the maps already in the unstable A1 homotopy category. So this is the tone space of a trivial bundle. And this here maps to the Gordonic vitring of the field. And this is an isomorphism if n is big enough. So this gives the A1 degree. And we've, you've seen this before this week, especially in the stable case, so where we can write it as pi 0 of the sphere spectrum over, over f. OK. Um, and I would like to give examples of um, degrees. Any questions so far? I should probably fill, fill these blackboard cleaning breaks by telling anecdotes about Bjorn. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, <laughs> maybe next time, maybe, maybe next time. Okay. Um, OK, let me, let me give uh, one example, which I think I've seen first in a paper by Dagger and Isaacson. Although, of course, uh, Fabian knew it. Um, so we look at um, the A1 degree of um, the map, which you get by sending the variable t to uh, the bth power. And this is um, b epsilon. So what is that? That's b half times the hyperbolic plane. So in quadratic form terminology, uh, yeah, that's this here. So this is the even case. And uh, if b is odd, it looks a little bit different. But also the hyperbolic plane shows up. OK, so what we have here in the, in the odd case uh, is one convenient 
uh, property, there exists some element in the Grotendieck-Witt ring with the property that if you multiply this element with this A1 degree um, of this map here, let me just write t to the k, uh, then you actually get the, um, the integer b. Pardon? T goes to, yeah, sorry. Oh, um, yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, this gives you back b if b is odd. So here you have a copy of the integers in the Grotendieck Witt ring given by um, multiples, um, uh, yeah, uh, by, by this trivial uh, quadratic form here. And uh, we would like to have the same if, if b is even, and this is slightly more complicated. Uh, so this was not in the paper by Darian Isaacson, but um, it's in the paper. You can get it from a paper by uh, Braselton, McKean, and uh, Pauli. Uh, so here's um, how the map looks like. First, so if b is even, we split it up like that. And then there are two maps, u and v, on a tomb space of a trivial plane bundle. Uh, so these should be given by sending x1 and x2. So for u, uh, we take something which should be familiar, maybe it's almost like complex multiplication, and for v, we have just the uh, s power here in every variable, and then we, we take um, um, the sum of these, and then we get um, um, we, we can sort of um, use this, this paper by Braselton, McKean, and, and Pauli to compute um, the degree, um, but in order to really get what we want here, um, let me look at um, composition of u, an R-fold composition uh, applied to v. So this is again an endomorphism of this guy here, and it's given by uh, homogeneous polynomials. Uh, it's given by f1 and f2. And then we get an endomorphism on the tomb space of a rank B bundle, V being even here. Um, so what we do here is we take F1 and F2 and F1 and F2 and so on. And then one can compute the degree of this guy. So if this here is then denoted F, uh, the de A1 degree of F has the following form. It's 3 times um, 1 plus minus 1. So this here to the R, this is multiplied with 1 plus S squared um, minus 1 half. And then again, the hyperbolic plane. What do I have to do now? Ah, oh, yeah. And um, so this is a b to the half power of that. And then uh, for this degree, um, we have another quadratic form. And you get this quadratic form by sort of doing, doing the same here, but just inserting suitable minus signs here. And then when you multiply, let me just put this into the, the box here, q times the a1 degree of this f. This is then not b, but it's a power of b. 
namely this here. And this will then be good enough for the application to this um, Adams conjecture. Uh, there I, um, oh, did, uh, I didn't, didn't write it down. So uh, you write down the minus sign here. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Right, I forgot that. I'm so stupid. Um, the yeah, so here Q is. Oh, thank you, Mark. I'm really... I'm always nervous when I speak on uh, birthday conferences. It's really... Uh, sorry, Bjorn. <laughs> I have to get more practice, but uh, yeah. who knows whether I will ever be invited again to speak at a birthday conference, <laughs> especially if this talk goes public. Um, okay. Does this answer your yes. questions? Um, I'm sorry, Mark. It's, uh, uh, what do I have to... No. All right, right. I have to tell an anecdote while I clean the, the board, right? Right. So uh, I can also tell uh, about the, the first time I met Gurren, or at least to my, my knowledge. Um, so I was invited, um, being a PhD student by Paul Arne, to visit Trondheim. So the first day I met Björn was a cold, dark February day in Trondheim. It was a very pleasant day. And um, I was very happy that I had a chance to, to talk to Björn. But it could have been, so this was in 2001. But it could have been that I actually met Björn before at another birthday conference. Have you been to Waldhausen's birthday conference, which no one shall ever name Waldhausen's birthday conference in 1999. I gave a talk there. You gave a talk there? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, another birthday conference, and no one was able to congratulate Waldhausen or say anything. Uh, and I was just a diploma student at that time, sitting at the entrance and handing out these, these name tags. And so. We probably have seen each other then, but yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. So, okay, so that's a clean board and an anecdote. I don't know whether I should do that the next time as well. Um, let's see. So, maybe let me let me summarize this um, as um, as a lemma. So, if F is a field. And then we have a natural number B. And uh, then there exists some endomorphism of this tome space. Uh, and some quadratic form. Uh, oh, and... Uh, maybe an exponent, so some m, such that the degree, the a1 degree of f times q is b to the m. So if b is odd, the m can be 1, but uh, we have not found such a thing in case um, b is even. OK, now this is sort of the trivial case. Now you have two vector bundles over S, um, vector bundles um, of the same rank R. Um, and then the question is, how do we, uh, do we assign a degree to these? Well, of course, you can take a, take a point. So uh, here's, a, here's a point, and the residue field Let me call it um, fx. Um, OK, you have these two, two vector bundles. And now if you have a map of 
Tom spectra, what you can do is you can pull back and you would like to um, pull back um, to this, this um, point. So I don't know whether I should write x or maybe f of x, I don't know. Um, and then we would like to assign a degree to that, but there's a slight problem. But this would, because, I mean, of course, we know that these vector bundles are going to be trivial over the field, but you would have to choose trivializations. So this choosing trivializations would then correspond um, to um, multiplication with a unit in the Grotendieck Wittering. So you do not get uh, a proper oriented degree, uh, you get an unoriented A1 degree. Yes? F is a map of Tom spaces. No, it's a, it's a map of of Tom spectra. So what does it mean F restricted to X? So if you if you if you pull back to a to a to a field, oh, this these bundles will be trivial. Oh, and if you take the, the F upper star of this. You take up upper star. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Any any questions? I only get questions from Mark. Maybe it's okay. Um, hmm? No, I think you're faster. <laughs> okay. So we have an unoriented uh, a one degree. Um, and let me denote this by GED A1 of F, um, all right, for, for a point X. And then the, the most prominent uh, case will be um, the, yeah, where X is a generic point. So this here is well defined up to multiplication um, by units in the in the golden dick vitrine. And updating your remark that you you mean the disoriented. <laughs> Should I rather say uh, disoriented? <laughs> hmm? That's, uh, well it's you just switch the orientation so yeah. it's uh, but I I do not know how to write it more unorientedly yeah. than that. <laughs> yeah. Is that is that okay? Yeah. yeah? Good. Um, do you do you want to see? Uh, so you might might think that well, when we when we can multiply with these units and so on, uh, this oriented un unoriented a one degree always comes from the the base field. Shall I give you a quick example that this is not the case? Okay, I take that as a yes. Uh, so here's an example. Uh, so we take S to be A1 with two points removed over the rational numbers. So we have a variable Y for this um, A1. And then we have D and E being a trivial line bundle with the variable T. And we have two maps we multiply with y all with y minus 1. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, and then we add these two. And then we get, so this here, this here is sort of a trivial line bundle. And this here, this, this um, map, the sum of these two then really has an oriented a1 degree. And this is, the quadratic form, well, given by the sum of these two units as diagonal form. And um, how can you see, um, so this here is uh, in the Grotnik Wittring of this function field in one variable, and you can embed 
this, this field in the field of real numbers. And actually, this is the reason why, I, uh, um, why I'm wearing this T-shirt. It's another thing that I learned from Bjorn is you should just put on the T-shirts that you like to put on. You should not, well, it's, it's your own choice. So Bjorn has so many beautiful T-shirts. Uh, and I've seen so many, especially those uh, sort of fabricated by his, his daughters. And uh, yeah, he's been a great advice when it comes to outfits, yeah, and you see me, so. Um. <laughs> okay, so you can use, uh, you can send y to pi, and then you get one embedding, and you can also send y to pi over four to get another embedding. Both of these numbers are transcendental. So what happens uh, when you, when you uh, take these embeddings, you get signatures, so you get the signature for pi, and when you use this form here, uh, the signature will be two, but for pi over four, the signature will be zero. And when you multiply this by a unit in the golden dick ring, then the signature will change at most by a sign. So there's no way that this here comes from the, from the base field, from the rational numbers. Yeah. Okay, just, a, just an Example, I don't know whether I should now mention that Björn's birth date actually appears in the decimal digits of pi. <laughs> Is this a surprise to anyone here? Maybe not. I can, I can tell you the precise position. It's after the Feynman point, I'm afraid. It's 202 million and something. Okay, um, let's see. Um, let me state a lemma. Hopefully, giving something useful here about this unoriented A1 degree. So we have two vector bundles, both of the same rank R. Again, S is smooth um, over F. Um, and then we have a map of these tom spectra. And then the following R equivalent. the unoriented A1 degree of this map F is 1 uh, for every generic point. The second is that the unoriented A1 degree is 1 for every point. And the third is that F is an equivalence. So if you want to prove the equivalence of these three statements, well, sort of that it suffices to, to check at all points whether something is an equivalence. This is sort of the, how do you say this, the joint conservativity of points. This is, for example, also explained very nicely in the, um, the memoir by by Tom and Mark on norms in motivic homotopy theory. Um, yeah, and in order to, to deal with the case, any point from the case of generic points, well, you, you have to use that the, the kernel of the sort of restriction to a dense open subset, that this consists of nilpotent elements, so there's a connectivity argument using uh, the homotopy T structure of Morel and uh, a theorem on his, um, um, in his uh, Springer lecture notes book. So that's this lemma. And when you have this lemma, let me state one theorem. And this would be a, a version, or this is a version of the the mod k doll theorem. So now k is b, so it's the mod b doll theorem. So you have two um, vector bundles of 
the same rank R. S is again smooth over a field. And B is some integer uh, invertible in this field F. And then you have a, a OK. Yeah, OK, maybe I want, OK, let me just, OK, uh, let's assume uh, S is smooth connected over the field F. And it has a generic point And then, yeah, that's, that's sort of the thing um, why, why I'm, I'm stating this, uh, why, why I stated this weird lemma on having this, this Q. So you want to um, take um, direct sums of your, um, your, your bundles so that then you can produce an, an element in the kernel. So taking direct sums of, of bundles, this is sort of multiplication with an integer. In classical topology, the degree of such a, such a map um, of, of spheres of the same dimension is going to be an integer, but here we have a quadratic form. So somehow we have to get back from the quadratic form, which is a degree, an A1 degree, back to the integer. And this is, uh, this is the reason for this um, multiplication thing there on top. So we, we suppose um, we have a map on Tom's vector over S, such that um, there exists a quadratic form over the, the function field with the property that the unoriented a1 degree of f times q um, is this integer b. And then there exists a natural number n such that um, the term spectrum of enough copies of D and E are equivalent. So this is the mod B dot theorem. And yeah, the proof is a bit lengthy. And I would like to leave that out for now and instead indicate how you can use that for the case of line bundles. So, so far, this is all just for the case of, of line bundles. And yeah, for the, of course, for the, for the homotopy theorists, um, this is uh, similar to what, what happens in, in topology, of course. Um, so how does this go? So we take a line bundle. And uh, then we get, again take this uh, integer uh, invertible uh, in the field F. S is again smooth over F. And then there exists some natural number and such that the term spectrum of B to the N tensor L is equivalent to the term spectrum of B to the N tensor L to the, uh, to the B. So this is the, the line bundle case. So this is the explicit value of the Beth Adams operation. So here's a short proof. So we already know that if we alternate the sign, there's really no problem when it comes to this, um, this question. So we can assume that B is positive. And we can also assume that S is connected. And then we have a generic point. And now you take this map from um, the lemma up there. Um, uh, 
All right. So maybe, yeah. So, so the 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 map there um, is sort of given for the for the trivial line bundle case. Um, but you can do this on sections. So um, this gives you either a map from L to L tensor B um, or B tensor L to um, um, B tensor L tensor B. So this is um, from, the, from the lemma above. Yeah, so this would send a vector V to a V tensor V tensor and so on, B, B many times. And you do the same here on, on sections. And then this lemma tells us there exists some quadratic form over the function field and some integer m with the property that the unoriented a1 degree of f restricted to the generic point times q. This is then b to the m. Uh, let's see. And this um, mod b Doyle theorem gives us an in, a natural number n, so that when we take the, the nth power of that, yeah, let me just sort of write down the, the even case here, because this is, uh, yeah, you get an extra copy of, of b that way, but of course it doesn't really affect the the statement, because then your your exponent will be m times n plus one. So the n here is not the same n as this here. I apologize for that. Okay. So that's the line bundle case, and now. There's a more general case to take care of. Um, any, any questions? You want to hear another anecdote? No? <laughs> okay. Good. <laughs> because uh, there has been a structured ring spectrum conference before the structured ring spectrum conference that Thomas has been to in 2011. And Jörn and I, we have been there 2002, I think, weren't we? In Glasgow? January? Around Robert Burns Day? Yeah. It was, again, it was cold and dark and I remember it was raining a lot yeah. and, and we had some conversation with Rick about, yeah, about the monoid axiom and at that point I, I, mean, I had applied for a postdoc position in London, Ontario and this was sort of my, my job interview I thought so I tried to leave a good impression and Eventually, I showed up in London, Ontario to find out that it was not Rick Jardine who hired me. It was Dan Christensen. Yeah. So I don't know what that tells you about me. I'm sorry, I should tell, tell you more about Bjorn. But we had this uh, discussion with Rick afterwards, and it was very helpful to have you, have you around So after, after Rick's talk. Uh, I, I, I hope I remember this correctly. But so, all right, uh, now there's an easy case to, to extend this, namely when your bundle is basically induced up from the direct sum of line bundles. So we assume we have a rank R uh, vector bundle over S, S uh, over F is 
smooth. Um, yeah, let me just say SB as before. And, um, and we assume the structure group of E reduces to the normalizer of the standard maximal torus in GLR. And then there exists a natural number. Yeah, so this is not the normalizer now anymore. Um, but yeah, this is the natural number um, such that the tom spectrum of B to the N um, tensor E is equivalent to the tom spectrum of um, B to the N tensor um, uh, B is Adams operation applied to E. So this is sort of the uh, standard way to uh, go along. I don't know, should I sketch the proof for that? Or is this something that is not... Well, what you do is uh, you take... Uh, I mean, you, this reduction of the structure group um, so, so you have um, so you have a torsor where you can take a suitable suitable quotient to produce you some some finite etal map of degree r, and then there are some nice computations again uh, by Bachmann and Hoyoa, which relate the f lower star for this tom spectrum with the corresponding uh, direct image on the level of vector bundles, and this I mean this this tells you that there's a there's a line bundle um, on this source of this finite etal map, such when you take the direct image, uh, you get uh, this bundle here. And when you take the direct image of the, the B's tensor power of the line bundle, you get the B's Adams operation. So this tells you that it suffices uh, to, to prove this equivalence um, yeah, in, the, in the line bundle case. That's, that's the idea. Okay, maybe that's okay. I don't know. Ah, yeah, right. Um, so now we have to use the transfer. And you've you've seen um, you've seen that I'm able to introduce uh, maybe inappropriate uh, notation. Um, so let me introduce some more inappropriate notation. Or maybe not, I don't know. So um, we take f from x to s smooth. And uh, we assume that when we take the sphere spectrum over s, we pull it back to x, we get the sphere spectrum over x, and then we push it down again. Uh, using this this smooth map, yeah. So this is uh, wait. Uh, this is x. Yeah. So this is the really the suspension spectrum of of x considered as a smooth S key um, with a disjoint base point. Okay. We assume that this here is dualizable. And then there's a, a transfer map. And I don't know whether it's appropriate to call it the, the becker gottlieb levine transfer. Mark? No? <laughs> OK. Well, you might think that this is just the Netherland extension by the famous bacon, lettuce, tomato, using Gouda as well. No, but it's becker gottlieb levine transfer. OK. Um, <laughs> OK. OK, there's a, there's a transfer. <laughs> and you define it as follows. You have a co-evaluation. And the, the dual can actually then be expressed using um, f lower star here. And then you 
switch the two smash copies. And then you take a diagonal. And then you take the evaluation map here for the first two, and then you land here. So this is the, the, the transfer map that appears, for example, in Mark Levine's paper, but it also appears in a paper of the other Mark from 2014 at least in a special case where f is smooth and proper. But, I mean, it's the same definition. Um, if you just have this, this um, assumption here, and one can compute that the Euler characteristic, which has appeared already in several other talks, for example, in Franjou's talk, and you get that the Euler characteristic is obtained by taking this, this transfer first, and then you have the co-unit map going back here. So this is the, the Euler characteristic. And Here's the, the analog of Brown's trick. You take f from x to s smooth, and we assume that this here is dualizable over s. And moreover, that the Euler characteristic is invertible. Then you have a homomorphism on Picard groups of the stable homotopy categories, and this is injective. So this um, analog of Brown's trick, then, wait, do I have, still have this lemma? Ah, yeah, so this lemma up there with, uh, uh, with this sort of special structure group, now we can get to that situation. And actually, the situation is really such that the corresponding smooth map is not proper. So this is sort of the reason for having this dualizability condition. And if you, if you remember, um, I had to invert the exponential characteristic in the statement of the, the first theorem I stated there after uh, Joseph Ayub's theorem. And the reason is that it's, as far as I know, still uncertain whether the corresponding homogeneous space is dualizable. Okay, yeah, let me just uh, quickly sketch uh, the, the, the proof. So now we take an arbitrary bundle. Vector bundle of rank R, and yeah, the, the usual assumptions, we can assume S to be um, connected. And then we have a, a GLR torsor associated to, to this E. And then we get x to be 
y where we um, quotient out the normalizer of the maximal torus. And what we have then is a smooth map from x to s. And this is a Zariski locally trivial fiber bundle. And the fiber is um, the corresponding homogeneous space. So maybe, maybe let me abbreviate this here as H. And then it's a theorem of Levine. And I think there's another um, proof due to Ananievsky that this guy here is dualizable in the stable homotopy category of f, at least when you invert the exponential characteristic. And then there's also a, a computation of, of the Euler characteristic um, to be invertible. So I have to, to, to finish. OK, so uh, then there's an, an um, sort of an argument. It's also in, in Levine's um, paper um, that in this situation, you then get that this x here is actually dualizable over s. Um, and the corresponding Euler characteristic is then also invertible. So we can apply this, this Brown's trick. Uh, but then over, over x, the, the, I mean, we can, it suffices to pull back the bundle and answer the question here about the equivalence of Tom spectra. But here, by definition, the structure group reduces to this normalizer. And this then completes the, the sketch of the proof. So I'd like to thank you and especially Bjorn for your, your patience. Um, well, your birthday will be in December, and uh, my best wishes for, for that and for you in general. Oh, yeah, well, there you also have that these elements are in the kernel, uh, but they generate the kernel. And there's a version for the, the real K-theory. So this here would be a, uh, I mean, it's, there's, a, there's a complex and a real version. This here would be an analog of the complex version, so one, one half of the complex. So did he use it to prove something? Or just no. <laughs> Well, I mean, there's uh, there's sort of this this um, I mean, what what motivated Morel to to formulate his conjecture on on pi one of the sphere spectrum was that there's this part coming from the J homomorphism, mm -hmm. and you can compute with these uh, well with with the appropriate object here, uh, a corresponding sphere. Uh, and with the Adams operations, and you see that the number 24 shows up here. Oh. Yeah. So that's, that's one motivation to, to maybe think about this. Right. Yeah. There might be other motivations. More questions?